Hey guys, welcome back to We Met at Acme. I'm so excited to be here with Lori Gottlieb. Hey Lori. Hi there. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So Lori, what is your favorite romantic gesture? Ooh, I think that people really need to um, ask other people what their favorite romantic gestures are in terms of giving them. And I don't have one single romantic gesture. I think it just depends on the context. Yeah, I think that's I think fair. I think I think the main one is um, surprising me with something very small, like mm. a funny text during the day or a flirty text during the day, something like that. I like that. Like, would you be into like a more racy text during the day or just leaving it at flirty? Oh, sure, racy, flirty, mm-hmm. all of it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, so you are an amazing author and you've written lots of incredible books. Um, two that I just recently read, the first was marry him that I read, and then maybe you should talk to someone, um, both of which I loved for different reasons in the book, marry him. And I know that like, that's a little outdated in terms of your own beliefs. Um, Do you think that part of like that book was kind of, and like, I'm curious what your thoughts are, it like playing into the whole scarcity mindset thing versus like abundance mindset. Um, What are your thoughts? No, first of all, it's not outdated at all. I, Mm -hmm. I, everything in that book is excellent advice for anybody who's dating. And I don't think it's about a scarcity mindset. I think it's it's it was really misinterpreted. I had written an Atlantic article um, that was supposed to have some humor in it, which apparently felt flat. But the book is actually a heavily researched book where I talk to everybody from psychologists and sociologists to behavioral economists to um, people who deal with divorce, marriage counselors. And um It was really interesting because I was really looking at what makes for happy, lasting relationships. And what I found was that it's that people, when they're dating, are looking for very different things than what they actually want in a marriage. And by the way, not everybody wants to get married, but if you're looking for a long term relationship or you're looking for a marriage, that's what that that's who that book is for. Mm-hmm. And and I think it's really about healthy relationships, healthy long term relationships. And so what I was saying wasn't, you know, you should lower your standards. <laughs> it was more about you should have higher standards, but higher standards about the things that matter. So a lot of times and this was written before I was a therapist, but even now as a therapist, I see so many people come in and they'll say, oh, he, you know, he said he was going to call and then he didn't call. But then, oh, we had the most amazing weekend. And then I don't know what happened. And they're always sort of on edge or the person isn't reliable or the person doesn't know how to communicate. And then they still say, oh, but I'm so in love with him or her. Right. And it's like, is that, does that feel good to you? Right. Is that something that you want to be in? So what I want people to do is to have higher standards about the character qualities, the emotional maturity. Do you have shared values? Do you have shared life goals? Do you like to do the same things? Not just the stuff that, you know, people will rule people out on a first date for so many things and they won't rule them out for like, oh yeah, maybe he drinks too much or, Mm, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe he's like, you know, maybe he's depressed and, you know, but they don't even look at that and how that will impact them in the long term. Right. Well, you had a quote, you quoted um, Nietzsche in the book saying it is not lack of love, but lack of friendship that makes unhappy marriages. And I love that quote. Like that I feel like is the biggest thing of all. And it always, it's so interesting to me when someone's like, oh no, like I could never, he's my best friend. I don't think of him like that. And I'm always like, but that's like, who, like that's all it is, you know, at the end of the day. Well, I think that people want their partner to be their best friend, but I think that nobody can fulfill all of your needs. And I think that's where I think our culture gives this message that, you know, when you find the right person, that they're going to fulfill all of these emotional needs for you. And they won't because it's impossible for one person to do that. So you need other friends. You need other best friends. You need your actual best friend. Right. Right. Um, right. You know, you need other people outside the relationship. And so 
the the mistake people make is thinking that you know that person is going to understand me completely and they're not always going to understand you completely and you do need to have other friends and you need to be able to talk to your partner and understand and help them understand you and understand them and understand that you're different people with different needs and sometimes you have competing needs at the same time right yeah no that's so true I feel like just that's a recipe for disaster is just expecting your partner to read your mind to, you know, have the same everything that maybe you feel with best friend. But I will say, like, I feel like your partner should be the person that you want to be with even more than your best friend when like you're alone hanging out. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's your it's your primary attachment. Right. Right. And I think that that's really important because again, when we're dating and we don't look for the qualities that we want in our primary attachment figure, um, that becomes really difficult. So yes, you want your, I think that what it comes down to is trust. What you're talking about is I trust this person with my vulnerability. I trust this person to see the truth of who I really am and love me, not in spite of it, but because of it. Hmm. Yeah. I I, this is the person that can comfort me and I can comfort them. This person always has my back. I feel safe with this person. Yeah. And I really enjoy being with this person. We love moving through the world together. The good right. times, the bad times, everything. You know, when people say, oh, I love being with this person through the good times, I say, do you also like being with them through the bad times? Yeah, that's because, so Because, you know, people will say, you know, like there's no one, I, th this, this was a horrible thing that happened in the world, in our lives and whatever, but, you know, a parent dies, you know, whatever it is, you lose a job, but I would, there was no one that I would rather have gone through that horrible period with than you. Right. Yeah, that's true. And I feel like it is those horrible periods that bring you closer when it's the right person for you, when you weather the storm at the end of the day, you feel closer to them after having gone through that together. Yeah. I saw that so much during COVID where people, people's relationships are sort of amplified. So if you didn't have a good relationship before COVID, it got worse. Yeah. But if you had a good relationship before COVID, it got better mm. because you got, you really bonded during that time together. Right. Yeah. That's so true. When you discussed in in marry him um mr good enough versus mr prince charming what do you think is the difference like mr prince charming is just unrealistic and mr good enough has the qualities that are good enough to make your husband or is that just the difference? or wife or mm -hmm. whatever um partner um it's not really gendered but i do think that we're all Mr. and Ms. and they, whatever, you know, we're all, we're all good enough humans. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of treat dating like shopping. Like here's all of the qualities that I want in a person. And we kind of wish that we could order people up a la carte. Like, oh yeah, I'll take, I like these, these qualities of the, of the main course, but then, you know, can I substitute out like that habit that they have with this other thing that I wish they had? Right. Can I substitute out this awkwardness with a little more social fluency? Can I sub, you know, it's like, there are no substitutions. People come as they come and we come as we come too. And people are going to see that there are maybe qualities that, you know, if they could, if they could order a la carte, they might order things a little bit differently. Right. But like, but how we, do we, know yeah, go ahead. But I was going to say, but, but I think that, that, so we're all good enough. And I think that it's not about finding the perfect person. It's about finding the perfect person for you. Mm. And there's a big difference between those two things. There's no perfect person, but there is a perfect person for you. Yeah. How do we know when we're trying to change someone too much versus like, it's actually okay to make these changes? You can't change another person, but you can influence another person. So if let's say that there's some disagreement that you guys have, or the way that you disagree is leaves you both feeling awful at the end. So you might change how you show up in those disagreements, and that might influence how the other person responds to you. A lot of people think, well, if you do this, then I'll respond differently. 
Like you have to go first. And I always say, no, you should go first. You be the person who goes first because the, your behavior will influence the other person to change in certain ways. We're all doing a dance with each other. And if you change your dance steps, then the other person will either have to change their dance steps too, or they'll fall off the dance floor. And maybe that's not the relationship for you. Yeah. But I, I saw, think that, mm -hmm. but I think that you, but I think that you have to be able to be the person who makes the change first, change your dance steps, see what the other person does. And you'll get a lot of information about whether or not you want to keep dancing with that partner. Yeah, definitely. I saw a video where you explained this a little bit and it makes so much sense. Like if we're just sitting around waiting for the other person to make changes, nothing's ever going to happen. The only person that we can control is ourselves. So you make that change and exactly like they have to respond and maybe they have to change because you've started it and they have to respond to it in a different way. I like that. That's right. And also the way that you that you make your change will help them to respond in a different way. So let's say that when you get upset with each other, um, you shut down or you raise your voice or whatever you do. Let's say that you decide, you know what, I'm going to calmly tell them how I feel or I'm going to come closer to them or I'm going to see their point of view and then tell them my point of view. So right. I'm going to make sure that they know that I heard what they said and I understand it and then tell them how I feel so that they don't feel shut out from the conversation, they'll probably respond a lot better than mm -hmm. to your shutting them out or to your raising your voice or whatever you happen to do that just exacerbates the dynamic, the dance between the two of you. Yeah. If you are someone who's choosing between, this is something that you had brought up in the book, between smart and passive versus less smart and proactive, how do you even know which to go with? Is that just based off of person to person? Hmm. I'm not really sure you have to choose. I, I think you kind of look at the person in front of you. And I think that the biggest question that people can ask is, do I feel good when I'm with this person? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't stop to ask that question. They might feel good because it's very romantic and all of those things, but overall, do I feel good in this relationship? Do I feel safe? Do I feel close to this person? Do I feel like I can get close to this person? Do I feel like this person can get close to me? So I don't think it's like dissecting the qualities that they have. I think it's more about how do I feel in this relationship? Yeah, that's really important. A, a lot of times people say, you know, people who are really happy with their partners and have been with them for a long time, they say, you know, this wasn't the idea of the person that I had in mind. And I, you know, like, like I met this person at a party, but if I had seen this person on a dating app, I probably wouldn't have, you know, I probably would have swiped left. So it's really interesting that we have this idea in our head that sometimes can be very rigid about this is the kind of person that I want to meet. And I think dating apps you know, make this a very zero sum kind of game, like yes, no, yes, no. But if you actually met that person in an organic situation, you might actually really like that person. Right. So I think that we can't just sit there and have this list of qualities. And I don't mean that we sit there and write them down. I mean that we often have them in our head and then we don't open ourselves up to the possibility that there might be a different person out there than we had envisioned. And that might be the person that we fall in love with. Yeah. And sometimes we do write them down. And I actually have in my own life, you know, before I met my partner, like I did make a list, but I did something that's similar to something you wrote about. It was like a want versus need list. And it wasn't superficial. Like it was the needs, like needs that are very important to me, like, you know, needs to be kind, like things like that, not like needs to have, you know, an accent and like look good in a bomber jacket like and I feel like so often today women especially like more even than men get like this thing that have you heard of this thing called the ick mm -mm. it's this terminology that I don't know where it started maybe on tiktok but it's basically like when you go out with somebody and they do one thing that like mm -hmm. kind of grosses you out and then you're you write them off immediately because like 
they made a cringe dad joke to the waiter and you're just like, ew, I'm never going out with them again. And Gen Z is like obsessed with this thing called the ick. And they're like one thing and I'm out. And I feel like that's so toxic. Yeah, it is, especially because you have to remember that sometimes people are just nervous and, you know, they're doing things because people do all kinds of unfortunate things when they're nervous. It's it's really nerve wracking when you're with someone that you like and you're maybe just getting to know them. And so, I mean, how scary is that, that someone can just rule you out for this 30 second thing that happens? It's so right? scary. It is. Yeah. And, and I think what happens is you don't really get to know people. A lot of people think like you either just know the minute you meet them or forget it, move on, because that's the kind of dating app culture. But I think that what people don't realize is that it can take some time, you know, like go on as if you had if you had a good time, but maybe you didn't have butterflies or maybe you weren't like the chemistry was amazing. But you're like, hey, I had a pretty good time. But yeah, no, I just wasn't feeling it. I would go on a second date and just see what it's like. Really, how hard is it to spend another like hour or two with somebody? And then you, you'll you have a better idea. Yeah. But people I, write people off so quickly. So quickly. I always say like, unless you are disgusted, horrified by them on the first date, go out on the second. Like, I unless you want to block them, there's no reason not to give them another chance. Because as you said, especially like people are nervous. Well, I, I would say if you were really bored or you had really nothing to talk about, I wouldn't go on a second date. But I think if you had like you had a good time, but you're like, yeah, I don't know. I I, I wasn't like super excited about this person. Mm -hmm. I would go one more time. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you're bored, I agree. That's that's not good. Um, what do you think are if there is even like a generalization of good qualities for a partner? Mm -hmm. What are they? Oh, there, there definitely are generalizations. This is this has been studied. Um, the most successful marriages are marriages where people have these qualities. And one of the top qualities is, well, first, emotional stability. So let's just put that one out there, emotional stability. So many people are attracted to emotionally volatile people. They'll say they aren't, but that's who they end up dating. People who are withholding, uh, on the one hand, or people who are volatile on the other hand. And it's like exciting, but it's not exciting. It's nerve wracking. It's crazy making. It's anxiety provoking. Um, so emotional stability. And that also means like, you know, some people have this thing like, oh, yes, this person is clinically depressed. And by the way, there's, you know, people are depressed, but like if the person is not taking steps to, deal with their depression or they have really debilitating anxiety, but they're not taking steps to work on their anxiety, then that's a real red flag because that's going to really interfere with the relationship. So if you are saying, you know, or this person, like, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're don't really acknowledge that they have an addiction, but they clearly drink too much a lot on a regular basis, or they have an issue with substances, whatever it is that's not going to disappear. So people need to be really mindful of that. Let's talk about emotional stability and, and how well they function in the world. And that along with that comes like, are they responsible? Do they, you know, do they, do they pay their bills um, on time? <laughs> right? Do they return phone calls? Do they, you know, how do they function in the world? Are they reliable people? But the next most important quality is flexibility. And flexibility is, you know, like, can they go with the flow a little bit? That doesn't mean like, you know, can they be a doormat? It means, can they be flexible because they're dealing with another human being? So can they, you know, do they need to have, do they, are they control freak? Do they need to have things their way all the time? Or can they be a little bit flexible? That's super important because life is going to throw all kinds of things at you and you're going to need to pivot and be flexible. Yeah. The other thing is emotional generosity. Emotional generosity is huge. Um, if they see you do something embarrassing, are they going to criticize you for it? Or are they going to be compassionate? Um, if you, um, you know, how do they act toward like the waiters in the restaurant? How do they act toward people in the world? 
how emotionally generous are they? Can they apologize and apologize without a but? Can they take full responsibility for something instead of trying to defend themselves? Can they, um, can they come toward you in a time when it's really hard to come toward you? Can they take time to like, you know, something is important to you and it's really inconvenient for them, but they're going to make time because you trained really hard for this marathon. So they're going to show up, even though they really wanted to be on this other trip at that time, you know, those kinds of things, emotional yeah. generosity. Which of those do you think can be learned, if any? All of it. Mm. But you have to want to learn it. Right. So it's not like, oh, look, I was flexible. Give me some brownie points here. And now it's a quid pro quo. So that means that now you have to be flexible. You just do it because you want to do it. You do mm -hmm. it because that's how you want to show up in a relationship. Yeah. This is a question that came in for you from one of your fans. They asked, how much does a significant other's family matter? And this is coming from somebody who is very close with their family and knows that you can't choose your family but is like clearly um, not a fan of their significant others. Mm, I think it matters a lot. I think what matters the most is what is your partner's relationship with their family? And how are you able to talk about their family with each other? Mm -hmm. So if there's something problematic about their family that interferes with your relationship, how do you talk to your partner about it? And how much can your partner take on the, the adult partner role as opposed to the child role in their family and really work with you and prioritize your relationship and make sure that boundaries are set, the discussions are had, and that they don't kind of take that passive role of, well, that's just how my mom is. That's just how my dad is. But they say, hey, mom, dad, this is causing a problem in our relationship, even if their parents won't react well, that you're setting that precedent that this is what's okay to do around us. This is what's not okay to do around us. Yeah. It's always so scary when your partner has some sort of like crazy family situation and they're almost like in denial about it. And they're like, what do you mean? Like my mom's just trying to, you know, be sweet to you. That is, I feel like the biggest red flag is when they like gaslight you to make you seem like crazy for not understanding their much crazier parent or something like that. Like <laughs> if they're aware of it, it's at least there's that. Yeah. And I don't think they're gaslighting you. I think that what you said is right, that they're in denial, that they don't right. actually see it. Gaslighting would be, yes, I see it. And I'm going to pretend that you're the problem as opposed to my parents are the problem. Right. But what denial is, I don't see the problem at all. I don't know what you're talking about. And mm. to be fair, there are going to be times when you both grew up in different environments. So what they consider a healthy family relationship might be different from what you consider a healthy family relationship. And that's something you need to negotiate in your own relationship. Right. Like my parents want a lot more, you know, someone might say my parents want a lot more contact with us. And you think that that's weird and intrusive, but the mm. other person is like, no, we just have a really close family and your family is very different about space than their family is or about showing up without calling or, you know, or about how, how often you're going to get together, those kinds of things. So those are things that you have to discuss and negotiate with each other. And that's where I think couples therapy comes in very handy. I deal with that all the time with couples. How do we talk about this? You guys, you know, obviously haven't been able to talk about it. Let's teach you how to talk about it so that you can work this out. Do you ever advise the parents to come into the couples therapy or it's just like, I'm going to give this couple the tools to deal with the parents on their own. Most of the time, I'm going to give the couples the tools to deal with this. And that's mm -hmm. very effective. You want the couple to have agency. You want them to be able to work together and to be a unit in this. Right. Your book, Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, has influenced so many people to see therapists who don't, um, which is so incredible beyond. Um and I know so many people who have taken that leap to start seeing a therapist after reading the book. What made you want to become a therapist? I had probably the most unusual path to becoming a therapist and the most nonlinear path. 
when I graduated from college, I worked in film development and then I moved over to TV development and I was an executive at NBC and I came to NBC. So this is going to date me, but I came there the year that both ER and Friends premiered. Mm. And so um, I spent a lot of time in the actual ER with our consultant coming up with story ideas for the show. And I loved the real stories. I loved, I mean, the stories on ER were amazing, but I really love the real stories. And, and he kept saying to me, you know, maybe you should go to medical school. You seem to like it better here than you like going back to the office. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not going to leave my job. I have this great job at NBC, but I did end up leaving my job and I went to medical school. And when I was in medical school, um, I saw that a lot of the, a lot of the professors were saying, there's this new thing called managed care. You're not going to be able to, to really spend a lot of time with your patients. And I really love stories. I realized like, I love the stories. That's why I worked in Hollywood. That's what I loved about the ER. Cause no one comes to an ER where something was expected to happen. So it was like a twist in people's lives. And you saw people at these really incredible and vulnerable inflection points in their lives. And I just, I love the power of story to connect people. And I wasn't, I didn't feel like I would be able to do that as a physician. And so I started writing and, um, my first book came out and then I started writing for magazines and newspapers and I was a journalist. And um, it wasn't until I had my son when I thought, you know what, maybe I should go back and be a psychiatrist. Maybe I should go back to medical school because I left after two years. And I called up the dean at Stanford where I was in medical school and I said, you know, maybe I should come back. And she said, if you do, you're welcome to come back, but if you do psychiatry, it's a lot of medication management and you're really interested in these stories and in having these really deeper relationships with your patients. So why don't you get a graduate degree in clinical psychology and you can you know, be a therapist and do the kind of work that you wanna do. So that was what I did. So um, I feel like weirdly, because I'm still a writer, obviously, I feel like as a therapist, my job is almost being an editor in the room that people come in with stories. And often we we have these faulty narratives because we're all unreliable narrators. So you get part of the story, the story that people see, the subjective version of a story. And I'm there to help them to untangle the faulty narrative and to help them write the next chapter in a way that's more satisfying for them. And you know, even some of the stories we carry around about ourselves, like I'm unlovable, or I can't trust anyone in a relationship, or nothing ever works out for me, right? Those are faulty narratives. So those are the kinds of things that I do as a therapist. And I think that being a writer has really helped me do that kind of work as a therapist. Yeah, that's an awesome combination. I'm so curious, because you have a background in the TV world, and you're a therapist, what did you think of, if you saw it, of shrinking on TV? (laughs) Um, you know, I don't, I don't like to sort of criticize other shows, but, um, I will say that I don't think the media has done a good job of really portraying what, what therapy is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I feel like that's kind of like a bro show. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like it captures the female experience at all. Totally. And it's very broad. And, um, so I, I hope that, I hope that, I hope that people do not watch that show and think that's what the therapy experience is like. I mean, that's why I wrote, maybe you should talk to someone is because I wanted people to see what it really is. There's so many misconceptions about what therapy is. People think either you're a blank slate and, you know, nobody wants to come in and talk to a brick wall or they think like you see on TV a lot, like the therapist is a hot mess outside of the room. And, you know, they're, they're just like completely, undone. And then they're, you know, trying to be a therapist and we're just humans. I I write at the beginning of maybe you should talk to someone that my greatest credential is that I'm a card carrying member of the human race, that I know what it's like to be a person in the world. And I think that that makes us as therapists, good people to help other people, because we're not like the expert up on high. Of course we have training and we know what we're doing, but I think that mostly it's a very human endeavor. And I think a lot of people don't go to therapy because they think it's something very different from that. And so Mm -hmm. I want them to see what it, what it's really like. And that's why we have the podcast too. I have a podcast called the Dear Therapist podcast, where 
we do actual sessions with people and you can hear them. And, you know, we have no prep. It's just like as if they came in and sat on our couch. And then we want people to see that therapy can be really practical. So we give them advice at the end of the session and they have one week to do it and they have to report back and let us know how it went. And I think that's the best. If you want to know what therapy is really like, listen to the podcast or read the book, because that's going to give you the best idea of what the experience might actually be like for you. Yeah. One of your characters in Maybe You Should Talk to Someone, Charlotte, has a lot of dating woes. Um, I'm assuming she's based on a number of people that you've actually seen in real life, maybe one specific one, um, maybe no one. Um, but what would you say is like the common denominator kind of issue that women are coming in to talk to their therapists about, um, or men, you know, when it comes to dating, let's say as like a 30 year old today. Right. So Charlotte is actually, all of them are real people. They just, all of their identifying information has been changed. And I think I used her in the book because she's so emblematic of what young women are coming in to talk about in their dating lives. Um, she came in, she was saying, you know, men, the men that I date, you know, they always, it always ends badly. I, I don't know why I can't find a good guy. And um, she didn't see her own role in it. She didn't see that she was attracted to those kind to those men, even though she was saying she wanted somebody different. And I always say, you know, there's this saying, um, we marry our unfinished business. We also date our unfinished business. And that means that weirdly, whoever kind of disappointed us, didn't treat us the way we wanted to be treated, hurt us in some way growing up, if we don't, if we haven't worked through that, we end up attracting those same kinds of people in our dating lives. It's kind of like, oh, our unconscious is saying to us, our, our subconscious is saying to us, like, you look familiar, come closer, right? Even mm -hmm. though they look very different, we're like, oh no, that's going to be totally different for my parent. And it's called repetition compulsion, where you try, you repeat the same thing, but with a different person, because this time you're going to win. This time you're going to master it. This time you're not going to get hurt by that person. This is completely outside of our awareness. So we end up like a moth to flame going for those kinds of people. And then what happens is we get disappointed again and again and again until we start to realize, wait a minute, I'm the common denominator here. It's kind of like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. Right. right. So if this keeps happening with every person that you date, maybe you are choosing people with whom that's going to happen. So with Charlotte, I mean, at one point, she even started dating someone from the waiting room. And it was, you know, I didn't know what his issues were because he was seeing another therapist in our suite. But it was like very apparent to me that she was this was not going to go well. And in fact, right. at one point he shows up with another woman in the waiting room. We don't know. Is that his sister? Is that his girlfriend? Who is this? It does not end well. And it isn't until she really tries to heal some of and does some of the grief work around her own childhood and what she did and didn't get from her own parents that she's then able to not try to seek that out from her partners and to find people who are healthy and people who are ready for a relationship and people who want what she wants. And it's interesting in that transition period, she would go out with those like better quality people, let's say, people more ready for prime time relationship. And she'd be like, yeah, really nice person, but I'm just not attracted to him. Hmm. Because what she's attracted to unconsciously is like the excitement of the familiarity. Like, oh yeah, that feels like something I know really well. So she had to get used to, oh, I'm just not used to this. This is like, you've like plopped me down into this new environment and I have no map for this. And until she could get past that transition point, um, she was really stuck in this, yeah, I'm going out with better guys, but I'm not attracted to them, to, oh, now I'm going out with better guys and I am attracted to them. Right. Yeah. That's such a real thing. I feel like that's the biggest thing is like, we're going through the wrong, pe we're going for the wrong people, or we are the common denominator. Like if you're fighting with all of your friends, why, you know, if you, and I remember I was similar to Charlotte when I was dating in my twenties and my therapist had said to me at one point, she was like, you always find these guys who like dip a toe in, mm -hmm. but like, aren't like fully in it. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Like, why do you think that is? And she was like, cause you dip a toe in. 
And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> like such a light bulb moment. Um, and that's such an important point because Charlotte did that too. She said she wanted the closeness, the connection, but she was terrified of it mm. because a loving experience for her growing up was very dangerous. You couldn't trust it. It would feel great one moment, then the parents would disappear, right? So she had a, a mom who was very present for her and then would get depressed and then really check out. She had a dad who was always like on these trips and kind of, she didn't know what he was doing. It was very unclear and he would be very close. And then he'd forget to call her on her birthday, you know, like, so she'd be like gutted and then she'd be like, I feel really good. It's like heroin, like putting the needle in and then right. it would get taken out. Right. And so when she would feel that rush, like the heroin rush of some new person, it was also very terrifying because it was like, oh, but I know that the needle's going to come out and I know it's going to feel terrible. And what mm -hmm. she needed to do was to stop looking for heroin. Right. Yeah. That's, that's meaningful. Um, when working with men, because I know you work with men also, do you, did you ever conclude, or is this just what a lot of women think? that men need to make like less concessions when they're looking for a partner than we do as women that like we have to you know choose the the best of the bunch whereas they have more freedom to choose someone that they think is out of their league mm. i think that men have more flexibility in terms of who they can date because we have this cultural idea that, you know, men can date certain ages um, and women have a very restrictive, women can date older, but they can't seem to date younger in, in our culture, which is just a cultural construct. It has nothing to do with who you're attracted to. And I think also, um, I think that that men in a weird way you know, people think, oh, men are so picky. I think men actually are less picky in a lot of ways. I don't mean that they don't have high standards. I mean that they're more flexible in terms of, they have a wider range of the kind of women that they will date. And I think that women tend to have a very narrow range of the kind of men that they will date. Hmm. So I do see that, but I think that that's actually, um, I think that you know, as women become much more educated and there are more college graduates who are women than men, it becomes more of a problem because it makes sense that women want to date people who are college educated if they're college educated, but there might not be as many men who are college educated. And yeah. then in the past, when there were more men who were college educated than women, men were less, uh, I guess, they, they didn't hold that as the like a huge standard for them. I It's like they wanted someone they could talk to, right? But they didn't have to have the same level of maybe intellectual connection. I think mm -hmm. men really want that nowadays though. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, we see this like much more egalitarian coupling going on where people really want people who are similar to them. But I think that one thing we don't consider is, of course, if you are someone where, you know, you're educated and you want to talk about lots of different things, um, that you want someone like that. But I think that there are people who are smart in all kinds of different ways. So if you can talk with somebody about all the things you want to talk with them about, but maybe they don't have the graduate degree and you do, it shouldn't matter because look at the person in front of you. So I think that's where we get tripped up a little bit. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. There was an article, I forget which publication, but it basically talked about like how men are more single than ever because of that education thing because of a lot of points that you just made. Um, and like women are, you know, not settling for a man that they feel like is less smart than them is, you know, any of these things. Um, well, you don't want to be with someone who's less smart than you, you, but you, but somebody who's maybe less educated is not necessarily less smart. Yeah. And I think too, I think that women want this thing that could sometimes be very incompatible, which is I want sort of the alpha guy, you know, like the really ambitious guy, the really successful guy, the real go-getter guy, the really kind of like socially fluid guy, uh, meaning that he's like very socially skilled. Um, and that might not be the person who, if you are also that way, that might not be the person who's like 
available to help if you decide you want to have kids, um, how are you going to divide up the responsibilities in the household? That might not be the best partner for you. So sometimes the people who maybe aren't as alpha, but are smart and interesting and you enjoy being with them are really good partners for really ambitious women who want to be the person who's the out in the world person. Yeah, that's so true. Like I, I'm so happy that my husband is someone who's not afraid to watch like a sh- shitty reality TV show with me on the couch. I, I'm so happy about it. And I never would have said like, I need a, a, a man who is not afraid to watch like, you know, real housewives, but I love it. Like, I really love it. And I don't think it, I, I personally don't think it makes him any less alpha. Um, and I think that so many women are caught up in the idea of like, I want like the quarterback who's like, you know, like the king of the bros. And it's like that guy a lot of the time. And like, obviously there's exceptions, but is kind of like not going to show up for you when you need him to. And, and of course it's, it's different, you know, for everyone, but like, I used to be into the mysterious guy. And I remember my friend was like, if you're giving birth in the hospital, like the mysterious guy isn't even going to respond to your text. Like that's not, that's not long-term and that's not what's going to make you happy. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. I never, I never really thought about that. Mystery is one of the most overrated qualities <laughs> in a partner. Yeah. I don't think anybody wants, you You want mystery in that, you know, I, I think there's this difference that people don't understand in relationships between secrecy and privacy. So we all need privacy. We all need parts of ourselves that are just for us. Secrecy is there's something that I should be sharing that I'm not. Privacy is just, I don't need this. It doesn't affect the relationship, but I need this piece to myself. Mm -hmm. So you need a little bit of, you know, not knowing every single thought that crosses your partner's mind because that can be exhausting. But I also think that when people say they want mystery, I think that what that is, is uncertainty and anxiety And I don't think most people really want that. It can be kind of exciting while you're dating for a little bit, and then it gets really old really fast. Mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about a partner, you're thinking about who am I going through life with? And I don't want to be wondering all the time. I don't want to be on edge all the time. And so we really need to think about that when we're dating. Who do I want to go through life with? And why should the criteria be different when we're dating? You know, it makes no sense. It's like, you're, it's like, why would you interview for a job? Why would you interview a candidate for a job where it's like they're great in an interview, but they're not, they don't really have the qualities or the qualifications for the job. So the interview should be reflective of the qualifications that you're looking for. So the dating, dating is really an interviewing process for both of you. And right. people don't like to think of it that way. It sounds very unromantic, but it's a getting to know, are we compatible? Do we feel like we would be good partners for the long term? Yeah, so important. The last thing I wanted to ask you about, or just like highlight, um, going back to marry him for a second, there was a line that I loved, um, which I guess you had learned in your research. It says, guys would say, I knew this person was the right person when we'd been dating for six months and she had to go away for a week. And when she was gone, I missed her so much. I thought that I felt happier when she was around. I realized how important she was. So this is a man talking about what made him realize how much he liked a woman versus women talking about, you know, chemistry and fireworks. And I love this because I always say like, guys decide how they feel about you in, in the missing of you, like when you're not there. And I always say like, how can he miss you if, if you're never gone? And I feel like that is the perfect example of of like men knowing that they're the one. And it's like, if you ask me how I knew my husband was the one, I'm like, I knew right after the first date, I texted my friend. And if you ask him, he's like, well, we spent like a series of time together and we got to know each other. And I eventually realized that like, I didn't want to think about life without her. And they're just such different answers. They're such different answers. And I just think that it's so amazing that you were, that you highlighted that so that Um, you know, women can understand how men fall for them a little bit more. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Men are all about what I was talking about earlier, which is how do I feel when I'm with this person? 
And for some reason, women are more about it. You know, we, we say that men are so superficial. I think women in a lot of ways, like really judge men on these more superficial qualities. How do they dress? We, we will say we don't do that. Mm -hmm. But when you think about it, it's like, you know, how do they reflect on me sometimes? Um, you know, when I'm with them, as opposed to how do I feel when I'm with them? Yeah. And then we have these very, again, this like Prince Charming idea, which, you know, most of us will say, I don't feel that way. I'm not, I'm not a person looking for Prince Charming, but I think we have these very rigid ideas from very young that we don't even realize get in the way sometimes. And I think also you have to think about the difference between men and women where men really value their time when they find the right person, you really are the person that they lean on because, you know, women have a lot of friends and men have right. friends too, but it's a different kind of friendship. So when mm -hmm. men come in for therapy, often they'll say something like, you know, I've never told anyone this before. And they literally have not told a soul. And it might be the kind of thing that women talk about over lunch. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's like, and they've been holding it in like this big secret, right? This big thing that they feel so much shame around or so much ambivalence around sharing with other people. And women will come in and they'll say, you know, I've never told anyone this before, except for my mother, my sister, my best friend, right? <laughs> yeah, so they've told yeah. like one, two, three, maybe, you know, they've told like a handful of people, but they feel like they haven't told anyone. So yeah. women have this other support network and men often rely on their partner for that, they have their their guy friends for all kinds of things, and they're important to them. But they have their partner for the things that women have other friends for. So right. I think that that's one reason that when guys are evaluating a partner, they really go straight into that. How do I feel with this person? Oh, I really mm. like this person. I really feel comfortable with this person. This person makes me feel really good. And right. I, I wish women would get there a little sooner in the dating process in terms of that mindset. Yeah, agreed. The only problem is when men are like, well, I feel so comfortable with you. Why do I need a therapist? I could just talk to you. And oh, it's no. Like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> Huge no. Huge red flag. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Lori, thank you so, so much for all of your wisdom. Can you leave us with a quote or piece of advice, maybe something from one of the books or just something that's helped you throughout the years? Sure. I would say the one piece of advice is to listen to how we talk to ourselves and to have more self-compassion. And I think about how when I'm giving talks, often, you know, I'll ask people, who's the person that you talk to most in the course of your life? You know, show of hands. And I'll be like, is it your partner? Lots of hands. Is it your parents? Is it your best friend? Is it your sibling? But the person that we talk to most in the course of our lives is ourselves. Mm -hmm. And what we say to ourselves isn't always kind or true or useful. And I had this client and she was so self-critical. And I think many women tend to be very self-critical, but we don't realize it because we're so kind to our friends, right? And so, but we talk to ourselves completely differently, the opposite. And so I said, listen, I want you to go home and I want you to listen to the voice in your head and how you talk to yourself. And I want you to write down everything you say to yourself over the course of the week and then come back next week and we'll talk about it. And she was very skeptical of this because she really didn't think she was that self-critical. And so she comes back the next week. She'd written everything down. She starts to read it to me and she starts crying. And she says, I am such a bully to myself. Like every second mm -hmm. I was criticizing myself. And they were things like she was, she was writing an email and she made a typo. And immediately she said to herself in her head, you're so stupid. She would never think that about anybody else that right. was, that made a typo. She passed her reflection in a mirror, you know, like while she was walking down the street and in a store window. And she said to herself, you look terrible today. And of course she didn't look terrible. If friends saw her, they would not think she looked terrible. So I think it's really important to ask yourself, is it when you're, to listen for the voice and ask yourself, is it kind? Is it true? And is it useful? And if it's not, change the, change the radio station, change the mm -hmm. channel, right? Because that's something from your past. That's an old voice. It was somebody else's voice. It was a story somebody else told you about you that was not true, that was much more about them than it was about you. And so now you get the chance to rewrite your story. Now you get the chance again to untangle those faulty narratives. And it starts with the voice in your head. And once you become more self-compassionate, you become more compassionate in your relationships. You become less critical of your partner. You blame them less for your own unhappiness. And you start to look at what am I doing? And it just becomes this virtuous cycle 
of kind, true, and useful with myself and with others. I love that. I'm going to do that exercise and I'm so scared for what I'm going to have said to myself. Uh, Lori, where can everybody find you? Listen to your podcast, read your writing and all of the things. Um, they can get, maybe you should talk to someone or marry him wherever they get books. They can find me on Instagram at Lori Gottlieb underscore author. They can listen to the Dear Therapist podcast. We are about to launch season four. You can catch up and listen to all the first three seasons wherever you listen to podcasts. And they can read my advice column called Dear Therapist in the Atlantic. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really enjoyed the conversation.